here this morning, like Rusty said, today is Mother's Day. Um, so happy Mother's Day, all you mothers that are out there. Uh, it's also a, kind of a day for us. It's kind of, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you guys, it's a weird morning uh, for me as I get up here and stand before you preach because, uh, you know, we have, uh, obviously, uh, Brother Gene was here for so many years and he touched so many of you guys' in life. And, uh, and so it's kind of a solemn mood out here this morning. I can just kind of feel it, you know. But then there's also the side of us where it's supposed to be a happy mood uh, because it is Mother's Day. And we have, you know, these three nice spring flowers, by the way, with, uh, which Miss Amy had helped decorate the church with and uh, did a wonderful job with that. So, so we have this mood where it's kind of a solemn mood where we don't know, you know, kind of how to feel. And we have this mood where we're wanting to feel excited and happy and, and, and celebrate. Um, and, and here's what I was thinking as I was sitting there. Um, let me be honest with you guys. Uh, I didn't know Brother Gene as well as you guys knew him, but I do know this about him from, from visiting with him and speaking with him and, uh, and phone calls and conversations face to face with him. I can tell you what he would want us to do this morning. I can tell you exactly what he would want us to do this morning. And that is to come and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's what he was all about. And that's what he wanted us to do. And, uh, and I can tell you right now, if he could come back and talk to us right now at this very moment, you know what he would say? He would say, you guys better be worshiping Jesus Christ because you don't have no idea what it's like up here. You know? and, so, uh, and so that's what I think we need to do this morning. So there is a sense of this solemn feeling where we miss Brother Gene, obviously, but then there's a sense of life and life more abundantly. And, you know, I'm reminded of the Scripture. I'm reminded of uh, in Corinthians where Paul talks about, oh, death, where is your sting? I get that, you know. I understand that because as Christians, really, oh, death, where is your sting? Yeah, we miss Brother Gene here, but you know what? We all know he probably don't miss us right now, you know? I'll just be honest with you guys. And that's an awesome, awesome, awesome thing. And so uh, I, I wanted to, to address that this morning and, and say that uh, because it is kind of a weird morning up here, you know? We have those two different sides, uh, but I don't, I don't want it to distract us from the Word of God. Because that's what we're here for, and that's what it's all about, and that's what it's always all about. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you for this morning. God, thank you so much for the legacy that is left at this church by one of your faithful servants, God. God, we see that this morning, and there are times when we have reflected on his life. But God, we reflect on his life because his life is focused on you, God. And that is where we want our lives to be. We want our lives to line up with that. We want to be focused on you in everything we do and everything we say. God, it's a special day as well because there are mothers here. And we take one day a year where we especially celebrate mothers. And God, thank you so much for the godly influence of mothers and, and the things that they do for us, God. God, if we are uh, still blessed to have our mothers here on this earth with us, help us to be able to tell them that we love them this morning and, and help us to be able to show them. God, for those of us that are here that may not have that honor or privilege to have their mother with them, God, I pray that you will give them comfort Pray that you will give them comfort through the memories that they have with their mother. That they will think about her throughout the day and, and the wonderful legacies that the mothers have left that have gone on before us, God. Now, God, be with this sermon. Be with me this morning as I speak. God, nothing out of my mouth needs to be from me. Nothing out of my head needs to be my thoughts, God, but have it to all be from you, God. Every single thing that comes out of my mouth and every single thing that comes out of my mind this morning, help it to be from you. Just make it from you, God. Have your Holy Spirit welcome in my life so that I can speak to your people. Because without the Holy Spirit, God, I, I'm nothing up here. I'm just worthless. But God, I know that if you speak through me, you will use me as your instrument and your tool to reach these people. God, I pray that you will open up hearts that are out there this morning have them to be able to hear the things that are said to them, but God, most importantly, have them to do the things that are said to them as well, God. Help, help us to have a passion in our heart to follow you. Thank you so much for the godly legacy of the mothers that are here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you got your Bible this morning, you can open it up to the book of Ruth. That's where we're going to go this morning. No big surprise, is it? Uh, Ruth is one of two books in the Bible that are written by women, uh, the other being Esther, of course. And so we're going to start to take a look at some of Ruth's teachings, and some of Ruth's, uh, some of the book of Ruth. Uh, it's not Ruth's teaching, it's God's teaching, but out of the book of Ruth. And so I think that what we need to do, though, first is, to, in order to understand where this book of Ruth is coming from, you have to kind of go back to the kind of the book before that. 
And in the book before that, it's called the Book of Judges. And at this time in the Book of Judges, uh, we kind of get a sense of how that this world was whenever the Book of Ruth was written. If you go just to the last verse in the Book of Judges, Judges 21, 25, if you'll kind of look up at that, and, and here's a kind of a sense of what it's like. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so you can kind of see, you kind of get a sense and a feel of what it was like in this day. In other words, in this time, it was just wild. There were no kings, there were no presidents, there were no nothing. It was just people did what they thought was right in their own eyes. And it kind of sounds familiar to today, doesn't it? A little bit. But know this, that there was nothing, no ruling, no anything. So it was just a wild society that they were living in. Uh, it was a time of judges whenever, uh, hence the name, the book of Judges. But then you go to the book of Ruth, and you find this book, and you find kind of a light in the middle of the darkness, you know? And you see this story that kind of pops up, and it's this, it's this moment of a godly, uh, godly family, one of the most godly families that were uh, around at this time. And you see that this story, this godly fam family, is moving to this very godless nation. Just a very place where it was dark and uh, a lot of idol worshiping and a lot of uh, just gods, uh, lowercase g. And so they were moving to this area because there was a great famine in the land. And they moved there because they were hoping to find some food. And so we pick it up in the book of Ruth and this is kind of what is going on. And they moved to this place called Moab. It's a very natural enemy to the Jewish people in that day. Um, and I think that the reason... Uh, we need to really get into the book of Ruth is that the book of Ruth can teach our families today some valuable lessons, I think. can teach our families some valuable lessons about some different things. And um, here's the first point that I kind of want to look at with this book. The first thing is that I think that we can uh, see from the book of Ruth that God is in the middle of all of our difficult choices. You moms ever had any difficult choices out there? Your moms ever made some tough decisions, you know? Yeah, they always, all, our moms seem like that they always are having to make tough decisions. Well, in the book of Ruth, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, if we'll look at that, we'll kind of see what's going on here. So, it says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there were these famines in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he, his wife, and his two sons. The name of the man was Emelech, the name of the wife was Naomi, and the names of the two sons were Mahon, and Chilion, Ephraites from uh, Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Emelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. So they moved to this land. They pick up everything that they have and they go to this faraway country, this country that despised their people in order to get some food. And what happened was is that when they get there after a time, and passed, Naomi's husband, Emelech, dies. And so now Naomi is left there as a widow with two sons. And so you can imagine the thoughts that are going through her head is probably, what do we do now? And, and so, you know, you get there and they move to this land where they're despised and you think, wow, Emelech died? That says doesn't sound like a God that's taking care of these people very much. You know, I thought you said, Eric, that this was a godly family. I thought that God was really taking care of these people. And, and I think that that's kind of the feeling that we get sometimes in our life, isn't it? You know, I, I've told you guys before, you know, that I kind of went through that when we first found out with Nancy, you know. <laughs> hey, God, I'm a preacher. I thought you were supposed to take care of people like me, you know. Hey, God, I'm a Christian. I thought you were supposed to take care of people like me, and I thought everything was supposed to be great. And, and it just feels like sometimes, doesn't it, and maybe I'm alone in this, but I doubt it, that God just kind of just piles it on you. You know, just things that after thing happens. You know, bad thing after bad thing. I mean, here's the deal. They got a family, they're a godly family, and they're starving to death, and so they decide, you know what, we gotta do something, so we're gonna move. And when they move, they go to this land that they were hated in, and then all of a sudden the main guy, the head of the household, dies. And you're thinking, Whoa, what's going on, God? Why are you doing this? And so it does seem like sometimes, at least in my life and probably in yours, it seems like we're sometimes left standing there going, why? What's going on, God? Why are you doing this? What's the point in this? But you see, Jesus kind of addresses this in 
John chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, he says this. He, he's speaking of a blind man who had received sight, and his disciples come to him and they ask him this question. And here's how it goes. It says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Now, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered and said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Must work, must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And so, look, sometimes whenever this bad stuff happens to us, and sometimes this bad stuff happens so that, quite frankly, the works of God can be revealed to them. I, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where it feels like you just everything's getting piled on you, and it feels like, you know what, God's not there, He's not present. But then all of a sudden you realize, you know what, God's really working for this. God's really showing Himself through this. God's showing Himself through this tragedy to people who wouldn't normally see this. I've experienced that. You know, I hate to keep going back to that illustration with Nancy, but we continue to experience that. You know, where it feels like right, it's getting piled on us time after time, but then I look back and I step back and I, when I look at the big picture, I think to myself, my God is using me to do this? He's using my daughter to do this? And it wouldn't nothing else have worked. It wouldn't have worked if it wouldn't have happened like this. There are people that listen that wouldn't have normally have listened had it not been because of this. And so I see now what it's talking about here, that the works of God shine through some of this stuff sometimes. And the bad things that happen to you, God uses it to glorify who? Himself. And so we have to remember that as Christians, that sometimes the bad stuff happens so that the works of God can be revealed through that. You see, this is what was happening in Naomi's life here. You see, her family, it was going hungry. Her husband, he dies. We'll go on to read, and her kids wind up dying. You see, sometimes this stuff happens because uh, God's work needs to shine through it. But quite frankly, sometimes this stuff happens too because we make bad decisions. I mean, let's be honest. We put ourselves in a lot of situations, don't we? Now, I kind of was looking at this book and I kind of thought, you know what, I think Ruth, maybe Naomi and her family, even though they were a godly family, they kind of put themselves in a bad situation here. Here's what happened. It, it's possible that some of this stuff happened in her life uh, because of the bad decisions that they made. It's possible some of the bad stuff that's happened in my life is because of some of the bad decisions I've made, some of the bad in your life, maybe because of some of the bad decisions you made. You see, they had the choice. They had the choice to either stay or to go to more. It was, uh, what they did was they made a choice out of their physical hunger, and, and I don't recall reading in the book of Ruth of any kind of prayer to God, you know, should we move or should we not? Should we stay or should we go, God? I, I don't see any kind of spiritual struggle there. What I see is that they just decided, you know what? We gotta go. We gotta go. We gotta take care of ourselves. And so let's go. Now, I'm not saying that you know God struck him let down because of this, and then he struck her children down because of this. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that they put themselves in this decision that doesn't look like there was much spiritual fault. And maybe I'm wrong, but the Bible doesn't record it. Much spiritual fault put into this decision to go. And so the choice to go to Moab was one out of hunger and physical want. You see, there's no reference here in the Scripture to this being a decision made consulting with God. And how many times do we do that? We make rash decisions and we make these decisions before we even consult with God. It is possible. It's possible that this stuff happened because they didn't seek God's will in their life. It's possible. You know? But read on Ruth chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. It says, Now, I'm talking about the sons. Now they took wives of women of Moab, and the name of one was uh, Orpah, and the other name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Melon and Chilion also died, and so the women survived her two sons and her husband. And so we go and we see, you know, Naomi's in a situation now. Now her husband's dead, and now her kids have died. And it just seems like it just keeps getting piled on her, doesn't it? See, but here's the thing. Here's what happens. 
We do make bad choices sometimes. And sometimes we have to deal with the choices we make, the consequences of choices, you know. I, I, I was, uh, I think it was Kayla, we was in Sunday school one day talking, and she was talking about being a teacher now. And uh, she was also talking about, you know what, the, as a teacher, she'll have kids come up to her, and they'll say, you know what, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did this. And they think that that's just kind of it. You know, and, and so Kayla was saying, "Well, I still have to discipline you for it." And they said, "Well, what for?" I said, "I'm sorry." And we kind of live like that, don't we? We kind of live where we think, you know, what if we say we're sorry, then we don't have to deal with consequences anymore, and, and it should be okay. And, and the truth is this: you know, you better be sorry. You better say you're sorry. But the consequences of what you've done sometimes you still have to deal with, it, right? Amen. You still have to deal with a lot of the choices that you make in your life. But here's the cool part about this. Is that the second point of this story, I think, that's teaching us as families and teaching us as people is this, is that yes, we make bad choices. You know, I, I made a few this morning. I'm looking out and a couple of you made some bad choices once you wore this morning. <laughs> just kidding, just joking, maybe. All right. But here's the deal. I, we all make bad choices all the time. I mean, we're just people. We don't, we're not perfect people, you know. But the point is this, is that God can still work and use those bad choices. And I've seen God do so much through people's bad choices. And it's an awesome thing because it's to know that we, may, we worship a God that can work in spite of the stupid, wrong, bad choices that we make. You see, this happens here in this story of Ruth. You see, one of the bad choices here was this, and it is this, it's the fact that the two sons, they decided to marry Moabite women. Now look, I, I, I'm not, this has nothing to do, this has anything to do with, you understand that these two boys were of Jewish faith, and they were called to not marry outside of the Jewish faith, you know. So it has nothing to do with ethnicity, you know, it doesn't have nothing to do with color of skin, it has nothing to do with that. The big point here is, is that they went against God's command because God told the Jewish people, you know what, don't marry outside of your faith because they're non-believers. And that's what was happening here. This was a bad choice that these two sons made. It's not because of the, the, the ethnicity of them, but it's because that they decided to marry these two women who were worshippers of false gods. This is what this town was, Moab. You see, we all make bad choices. We all make mistakes in our life. Some of us need to remember that more than others, right? Here's the thing. It's not excusing it. You see, God, He still doesn't like that. He still doesn't like the stupid choices I make. You know? It's not excusing, but the really, really cool thing about all this is this. Is that God can take our bad choices we make and redeem them for His purposes. That's the really awesome thing about God. Because look, Romans 8.28 says this. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. You see, here's the deal. The bad choices you make, it may take time. The bad choices you make, you may have to suffer pain. You may have to suffer disappointment. You, you, may, you, may have, you will have to deal with the consequences of them. You see... This might take time and pain may be involved, but God can work good from what Satan intended to be bad. And that's the great thing about God. That's the awesome thing about God. See, don't you think that Naomi, after her husband died and she's sitting in this godless country, and she's sitting there and then all of a sudden she gets the word that her two sons are now dying, and now Naomi's a widow and she's alone probably, she feels alone, I'm sure, in this godless nation, and she's probably sitting there going, oh, I wish I would just stay home. You know? I wish I would just, I wish I would just stay home. Maybe she was thinking up at night, thinking, why didn't I consult with God? Why didn't I seek His will in this? What, what is going on? Maybe all this stuff was going through her head. You know? I guarantee you she sit up at night sometimes, wondering, God, why me? You know, God, why? Why'd you do this to me? I'm sure she'd sit up at night like that sometimes. Why did all this happen to me? But you see, here's the thing. We have to understand that it's every choice we make, whether it's good or bad, we have a God who is behind the scenes 
weaving together a story that you can't completely see yet. Think about that. I, I told kids and talking to kids a lot. Um, I, I love this uh, thought. Every choice you make, you're basically building your own house. Every single choice you make, you're building your own house. In other words, every choice you make, you're building your own life out of that choice, right? Everything you choose to do, it affects what you want to become. Everything. But here's the really cool part about that. We worship a God who, despite some of the bad choices we make, He can still use those. He can still use those bad choices and weave together such an awesome, awesome story with your life. Amen. You, see, you see that with the book of Ruth. Is he used some bad choices that were made here, but my goodness, what an amazing story that we see that was weaved out of this. We'll see it in a little bit. So, Dave Stone, I mean, yeah, I'll quote him as saying this. I, I like this quote he says. He says, God doesn't control our choices, but our choices become the threads which God weaves. That's really cool. You know? That's a really neat saying. Is that God doesn't control our choice, but our choices become the threads which God weaves. And so know this, look, here's the deal. A lot of people have come in here maybe this morning and thought, you know what, it's too late. I've already made a bunch of bad choices in my life. Maybe a lot of you moms have come in here, you know. And, and maybe some of you moms are sitting there thinking, man, I made some bad choices in my life, Eric. You don't understand. But here's the deal. Know this, that it's not too late for God to work despite some of those bad choices, you know. Because here's the third and last point that I wanted to make that despite us making bad choices and God, He's able to use that, know this, is that God will still lead us in our important choices that we make. He can still lead you and I in important choices that you have. Ruth, verses 6 through 18. Here's what it says. It says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return to the country of Moab, uh, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of your husband, and so she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices, and they wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? There are still sons in my, are there still sons in my womb, that there may be your husbands? <coughs> Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should say I have a husband tonight, and should also bear sons, would you wait for them? Until they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters. For it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and they wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods, lowercase g, return after your sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do to me, as more also, if anything, but death parts you and me. And when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? And so here's the story here. God wants to be involved in every decision you make. Every decision you make, God wants to be involved with that. Listen, I have said and I have thought at times, Why? <laughs> Why does God want to be involved with every decision that puny little old Eric makes? He's a big God. Why does he care what decisions I make? You know, I mean, I'm one of billions of people on this earth. Why does God care about the decisions I make? And it kind of 
thing boggles my mind to think about such a huge God who wants to be a part of decisions that I make. You ever wondered that? You ever wondered why God wants to be a part of the decisions that you're making? Here's the reason. It's because He's a personal God. And He cares about every single detail of your life. He loves you. And He cares about you. See, verse 16 to this, it's very curious to me how Ruth responds to this. Ruth is going on and she is basically, she's saying, she's begging Naomi, saying, I, no, 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 I'm staying with you. I'm going to die where you die. I'm going to be buried where you're buried. I'm going to follow you to the ends of the earth. Your God is going to be my God. That's a big statement. That's a big statement. How many of you uh, out there would tell your mother-in-law that? No hands. Okay, Miss Donald. I don't know if I would. My mother-in-law's not here, so I'll be safe. But Ruth is going on and she's saying, hey, I'm going to go with you. And it kind of is curious to me as to why does, why does she go with Naomi? Why does she not just go back? Here's the reason, I think. I think that what happened is that Ruth had seen in Naomi what a Christian woman was supposed to be like. Ruth had seen something in Naomi that she hasn't seen <coughs> anywhere. Ruth saw something in Naomi that she did not see in the women in her godless country. You know, maybe she had seen every single thing that Naomi had just been through. All the heartache, the loss of a husband, the loss of children, the going hungry. Maybe she looked at Naomi's life and she had seen this, and but what she noticed in Naomi's life is that even though she went through all of this, she still clung to her God, capital G. And you see, Ruth saw that in Naomi. She saw something in Naomi that she had not ever seen before. She seen something in her mother-in-law that she had not seen before. And when she seen this, she wanted this battle in her life. See, many of you, maybe, maybe you've seen something in Brother Gene's life that you've never seen before. The kindness and the compassion. You know? Maybe it was all of this that you've seen in Brother Gene's life that it caused you to love and adore him like you have. Let me tell you what you saw in his life. And let me tell you what Naomi or Ruth saw in Naomi's life. They saw God. They saw a person allowing God to work through them. And you know what happened? The same thing happened with Ruth and Naomi as it maybe it's happened with you and Brother Gene is you want that. You want to be that. You crave to be that. There's something inside of you that you know you were made to be like that. Brother Gene wasn't perfect. He had his flaws. Naomi wasn't perfect. You see, she messed up, made some bad choices. But here's the thing. The bad choices that they make, they worship a God who can work through those bad choices. And still allow God to weave their life together through bad choices that they make. So let me ask you this, since it is Mother's Day. I want to know... I want you to think about this to yourself, moms. Do your daughters, do your daughters see that in you? Do your daughter-in-laws see that in you? Do they see a life full of God? Do they see a life full of purpose and passion for God? That they too have to have it. That they too have to know and they have to be a part of it. And they will follow you to the ends of the earth because of the God you worship. Do they see it in your life so much so that they say, you know what? Your God will become my God. Do you see that? Do you see that, daughters and your mothers? You see, moms, what do your daughters see in you? Here's the thing. Ruth was probably just blown away by the fact that Naomi was taking a part of her life 
that, that she was taking involving in Ruth's life, and that, that she didn't just say, all right, I'm gone. She was blown away at that fact. Moms, are your daughters blown away by the fact that you take involvement in their life? Moms, do your daughters, do your sons, do they see God in you? Because if they see God in you, then I can tell you this, they will be like Ruth. And they will drop everything they have and they will say, I'm going to be part of that. But here's the deal. If they see the world in you, you know what's going to happen? They're going to say, I've seen that show. I mean, I'll, I'll follow some of that, but you know what? I don't know if they know what they're looking for. <coughs> they see God in you, they're going to see something totally different in you, moms. You see, Ruth saw God working through Naomi. Ruth saw Naomi, a person who had flaws, a person who made bad choices, but yet God still used her. They saw that in her. And you don't know what? Too many of us mothers today, us mothers, like I'm a mother. <laughs> Too many moms today, we're so worried about covering up our imperfections. You know, I mean, because we don't want people to see us for who we really are. But let me tell you something, moms. Some of these daughters in here, they need to see you like you really are. They need to see you as a person who's making bad choices every now and then. They need to see you as an imperfect person. They need to see you as a person who allows God to work through them. Despite it. You see, that's what happened here. Is that Ruth was blown away probably because Naomi had taken an interest in her life. And she wanted that. And so through Naomi's friendship with Ruth, ultimately what happened was is that Ruth found God through the friendship of Naomi. Have you ever thought about this? The consequences of this story right here are so heavy. What would have happened if Naomi had, had all this stuff happen to her and she would have just left quietly in the night and Ruth would have went back to her gods, lowercase g, what would have happened in that sense? <coughs> you see, God used Naomi and her imperfections to lead Ruth to a life of God. And here's the deal. Look, I don't know if you know this, but Ruth wound up being the mother of Obed, which was the father of Jesse, which, guess what, was the father of David, King David, by the way, which, uh, by the way, Jesus Christ, bloodline comes through. through. Do you see how important and heavy that this story is? And it all goes back to one little old woman. One little old widowed woman who chose to allow her daughter-in-law to view her imperfections. So moms, who are you letting see your imperfections? It's okay. It's okay to let them see your imperfections. Because you know what? It can be just like this. It can happen just like this story happened here. Is that your imperfections can lead somebody to Jesus Christ. But here's the problem with moms. We are not allowing that in our life anymore. We use so much makeup to cover up everything now. We don't want anybody seeing our imperfections. So what? Because through your imperfections, there could be a lot of people who see God work through you. Amen. You've got to allow that, though. Because God can use your imperfections, He can use your bad choices to weave together a story that is unbelievable. He used it right here with Naomi. You see what He did? He used her imperfections to weave together a story, by the way, which brought us the Son of God which brought us salvation, which brought us life everlasting. See, I don't think that a lot of people realize how important they only was. And I don't think a lot of mothers in here maybe even realize how important they were.
See, God can take the pain. He can take the mistakes in your life. He can take all the pain, all the disappointment, all the tragedies in your life. And here's what He can do, moms, is He can make something great out of it. So thank God for moms. You know? Thank God for mothers. Thank God for godly, God-fearing mothers. But my challenge to you, all moms, is this, is that we're trying to hide your flaws so much because the younger generation, we need to see that sometimes. We need to know that you weren't perfect. That's a lot of pressure on the younger generation. Did you know that? To look at you guys sometimes and see that you're perfect and you're sitting here with, with everything just lined up just right. You know, and what we didn't see is the time when you were maybe our age and it was hard. You know, need to know that that was going on in your life. Because a lot of times what we look at and see now are perfect moms out here. That's a lot of that's a lot of pressure to some of these young ladies. They think that they gotta be perfect too. See, God, God doesn't, God, God's already taking care of the perfect part, okay? He just wants to use you like you are. He wants your imperfections to teach someone else. He wants your imperfections to draw them closer to Him. So, moms, we love you. We praise you. Let Jesus Christ work through you so that we can all see it. And we can all follow Him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the mothers that are here, God. I thank you so much for the godly influences, God. As I sit and as I look out among the crowd and I see all these mothers here, God, and I look at all the influences that they have. Look at the younger mothers who have little kids running around them and the amount of influence that they have in those lives, God. God, I look at the older mothers that are here. Their little grandkids that are running around here. The amount of influence that they have on their lives, God. God, I pray that you'll bless these mothers in this church. God, I pray that you will allow these mothers to do something special. That you will put a fire and a passion in these mothers' hearts. That they are concerned about nothing else but the fact that people see you working through them, God. God, thank you for this reminder from Ruth and, and how that we don't have to be perfect, God, but you can still use us. God, thank you for that. Thank you so much for that. Now, God, if there's one person here who needs you this morning, I pray that they will come and find you. God, if there's one person here who needs to get back to you, I pray that they will do that too. God, just be with this church. Help us to continue to walk in your ways, to talk your talk. God, thank you for your love. Most of all, man, thank you for Jesus Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. Amen.